he actually tells us that the world will hate us because it hated him first, because we will stand for things that the culture does not want to hear. But are we willing to speak openly about him, or are we going to have fear of persecution? This week we are in, in John chapter 7, which reminded me of a couple of things. So, anybody here really like camping? Yeah? All right. Why? Just, just kidding. But I have a couple of stories. So, if you know anything about me in terms of my like personal habits, I... You know, I shower like at least twice a day. I just, I don't like getting dirty. I don't like, it's just gross out there. I think nature is beautiful. I just don't want to touch it. Now, as a, as a youth, I had this youth pastor who was kind of an adrenaline junkie and crazy. And he invited us all to go on a hiking trip in the high peaks in the Adirondacks. And I thought, well, everyone at youth group was like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. We need to go. So, of course, I said, yes. That was a mistake. So this is how the hiking trip goes. Now, I didn't look like I do now. I was in very good shape because I was a tennis player. And so, you know, I was running probably five miles a day and all sprinting because it was just back and forth on the tennis court. But... This hike was horrible. So he gets us, we get out of, the, out of this van. By the way, he had a, like a nine-passenger van or whatever those giant vans are that should kind of be illegal on the road. That's what he's driving. And I remember as we were taking exits and entrances on and off of the expressways and the throughway, he would tell us all to lean to one side of the van so that it didn't tip over. We're not even hiking yet. And this is how it starts. We get to the mountains, and he's like, all right, guys, let's go hike up to camp. I'm excited. A couple of hours go by, and I go, when do we get to the camping part of this? Because we've been hiking uphill forever. When does this stop? And he goes, don't worry, we're almost there, meaning we were almost halfway there. So more hours go by before we get to the camp. All right, now we get to the campsite. Now, I'm thinking, great, we're, we're, we're making camp. Who brought the tents? Now, I'm not thinking like it's going to be an RV or a camper. I'm thinking we're going to get a tent, and we're going to sleep in the tent. I was wrong. There's a couple of lean-tos at this spot. And he says, all right, this is where we're sleeping. Sometimes lean-tos aren't so bad. So I need to describe these to you so you understand what's happening. There's like four giant logs sticking out of the ground. You can still see the maggots and like worms crawling through them above you. The dirt part underneath the lean-to, you can see the worms and the spiders crawling around. And he's like, yeah, just lay your sleeping bag down there. And I'm like, I have to sleep in that? I'm pretty sure I ate 10 spiders that night. It was gross. Now, the, the interesting part of this is as we made camp was the crazy juxtaposition because as we were in this dirty, disgusting, lean-to spot, one of the campers who was with us was no longer a kid from youth group, but he was actually coming back from college and he was going to the Culinary Institute of America. So he pulled out of his hiking pack all kinds of crazy camping tools, pasta he had hand rolled before the, the trip. He had, I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this, but it was like a bag that was a Swiss army knife of spices that he just rolled out. So I'm like, what is happening right now? 
This, so this was the good part of the trip. He made us a gourmet pasta dish from someone who has just graduated from going to the Culinary Institute of America. And our backdrop was worms and spiders and mosquitoes eating us alive. And I was like, how far are we from where we're hiking? And he said, we're about a third of the way to the peak of the mountain. So tomorrow, we're going to the peak. And this, this was only a third, and it was straight up a riverbed. It was horrible. When we got to near the peak on this mountain, there was a, just a vertical wall. And so the trail ends, and then there's a vertical wall, and the trail is on the wall. So you have to free climb. Now, it's only like 10 feet, so it's only like two or three holds before you get to the other part of the trail. But while you're hanging on the wall, you're on this flat, straight, steep down, and you can look and you go, if I let go of the mountain, I die. So that was probably the most awesome part of the trip. Just looking down, down into the Adirondack Mountains, you see all the pine trees and the lakes, and you're just hanging there knowing it's just God is the thing holding you up. And you get up to the peak of the mountain. Now we got up to the peak and a bunch of the guys, oh, once you get to the peak, you can take a trail to a different mountain. And so everyone said, Steve, do you want to go to the other mountain? I said, are you people crazy? <laughs> I just got here. Do you... I don't go to the most beautiful places on earth to turn my back on them and then also put my body through more torture. You guys are nuts. So that was one trip. And I thought, it doesn't get worse than that. I was wrong. So after college, a couple of friends of mine and I decide we're, we want to take another trip to the high peaks of the Adirondacks. These two guys weren't with me on the trip I went on before. So I thought, they're not crazy. Apparently, all my friends are crazy. So we go on this trip. We're hiking to the mountain. Now, this, the hiking wasn't as bad. But one of my friends, his name is John, about six months after this trip, he decided he got laid off from his job and he got a huge severance check and he was about to get married and he had another job lined up for after about six months down the road after he got married. So he decided in that six month time frame, he was just going to live in the Adirondacks. He just went with one hiking pack and just lived up there for six months. Now this was after this trip, so I didn't know how crazy he was going on the trip. But he's kind of the guide and the leader as we're walking in the mountains and we hiked Mount Giant and we got to this really cool place in this campsite was this it was flat and then about a quarter of a mile away from our campsite was a bare rock face that was just out kind of jutted out from the mountain and in the middle of the night we hiked out there and we laid down on the bare rock face there were no trees above us no light pollution we turned off our headlamps and then the stars looked like softballs it was amazing it was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen but one of the grossest things I've ever seen was our campsite was about 100 yards away from a pond of still water. And John decided we needed to hydrate before we hike the rest of the mountain the next day. So he filled all our water bottles up with the still water from that nasty pond. And he just put the drops in it to purify it, which, so it's okay to drink, but there's stuff floating in it. And that's what I was drinking as I was putting myself through torture. Um, so camping to me in this way has never been the most fun, but there are always moments that I can look back, like the moment where I was hanging on a mountain and I could see the whole range and all the lakes and the ponds. And I thought, man, this is this is God's creation, it's beautiful. Or the moment where I sat down at that rock face and I turned off the headlamp and I saw the stars. And I thought, how can anyone look at this and not know that there's a God who created it? This is just, if it was just random chance, it didn't have to be this beautiful. God is, is an artist. This is amazing. Now, I tell you this because what we're talking about tonight is kind of a camping trip. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. It's about six months before Jesus heads to the cross. That's where we start with tonight. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles 
is important. It's one of three feasts in Judaism where if you were able, if you were an able-bodied male, you were supposed to travel to Jerusalem for one of three feasts every year. And the Feast of Tabernacles was one of them. Passover was another one. And Shavuot, or Pente Feast of Pentecost, would be the third one. So this is about six months before Jesus heads to the cross. And the Jews are heading to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles commemorates the time in the wilderness. When the Jews had escaped slavery because God delivered them from the Egyptians, but they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And they wandered around as nomads with tents. And the tabernacle itself was a tent structure built for God to dwell among his people as they wandered through the wilderness. And that's what they're commemorating. And as they were wandering through the wilderness, God would guide them by day through a pillar of cloud and at night by a pillar of fire to keep them knowing where they needed to go. And on that journey, twice, as the Israelites complained because they didn't have water, they were wandering in the desert, Moses struck a rock and water came out of the rock to save them from their thirst as they're wandering through the desert. This is the, this is the journey that's being memorialized through this feast. That's important to understand. Now, they're obviously in Israel at this point, and they're commemorating this. Now, part of the practice of commemorating this was at night, they would actually take giant bowls and pots on the temple courtyard and around the temple courtyard and fill them with oil and light them on fire. And you could see the temple all the way throughout Jerusalem at night because it was lit up by fire. Of course, this is to give the next generation, as parents take their kids to the Feast of Tabernacles and they're standing outside the temple, which is the upgraded tabernacle, to see what it was like wandering around in the wilderness with God guiding you by a pillar of fire. And they're seeing the whole temple lit up by fire at night. And then every morning, they would do something called the libation ceremony. Every morning, one of the priests would take a golden bowl and he would hike down to the city of David from the Temple Mount, and he would fill up the bowl, the golden bowl, with water from the Gihon Springs, from the, the Pool of Siloam, down in the city of David. And he would carry it back up to the temple, and they would pour that water on the rocks, under the basin, under the altar, the bronze altar, where things were sacrificed. And that would give the next generation, an idea of what it looked like when Moses tapped the rock and water came out to, to save the Israelites. And that's what's happening. This is important to understand for context of what we're going to talk about tonight. And so it says in verse 1, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Well, the first verse is interesting. Jesus is not wanting to go down to Jerusalem yet because he knew the Jews were looking to kill him. Well, as we've been talking about over the last few weeks, there was a moment that really kind of perturbed everybody and stirred up a hornet's nest. Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, a man who couldn't walk for 38 years, and he healed him. And the Pharisees got wind of this, and they didn't like it. And so now they want to they kill this, this prophet, this guy that they don't understand, who threatens them, who threatens their power. So his brothers, Jesus' brothers, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, even show yourself to the world. So, well, verse 5, For even his brothers did not believe in him. So, Jesus' brothers, so Mary and Joseph had some kids, and they didn't like Jesus. I can understand a little bit. I mean, Anybody have a sibling that your parents thought were perfect? Imagine if your sibling actually was perfect. Now, Jesus' brothers didn't like him, and they didn't believe him. They didn't understand all of the love that Jesus was getting and all the attention he was getting as a, as a preacher. And I'm sure that growing up in life, Mary and Joseph knew they were caring for God's son, and they understood his call. And I'm sure he got some attention that his brothers didn't appreciate. And so... They're upset with him, and they're trying to, to goad him 
into going down to Jerusalem. And he says, you don't want to do, you want to be known openly if you're, suppo if you're supposed to be the Messiah. Come on, Jesus. Why don't you go show yourself? Why don't you and your disciples go down there and show yourself to them and do the miracles that you're doing? And they're trying to prod him. Now, it's not because they're trying to give him actual sage advice. I think they knew that the Jews wanted to kill him. So Jesus doesn't buy it. Jesus says to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. But Jesus says, I'm not going yet. You don't understand because you're, you're in this culture, you're in this world, and you are opposed to what God is doing. And so is the culture. And so the culture accepts you. But it doesn't accept me. It wants to kill me because I'm telling them the truth. And so he tells them to go ahead. Now, when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So he stayed behind. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So Jesus does go a little bit later on, but he, he hides out. Now, the truth is, Jesus knew what his time was, and he knew his time was six months down the road for the cross. But that doesn't mean that you put yourself in harm's way for no reason. So he went in secret, and he tried to hide. But there was much complaining about the people, and some concerning. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, this is interesting. The people at, in Jerusalem at the feast, there's already murmurings. You see every aspect of society. There are people who think Jesus is a good guy, who think he's a good teacher and a prophet. Jesus is more than that. And there are some who think he's crazy and he's stirring up trouble. But no one was willing to speak openly about him because of fear. Now, I think if there's any principle from tonight, that's a good one. The world as it stands right now is in opposition to the things of God. It doesn't like hearing about absolute truth and about the differences between good and evil. But Jesus stands there in the gap, and he affirms the law, and he tells us what is good, what is evil. And he, he actually tells us that the world will hate us because it hated him first because we will stand for things that the culture does not want to hear. But are we willing to speak openly about him, or are we going to have fear of persecution? And that's the fear that everyone's feeling. They'll grumble among themselves, they'll talk to the people that they know, or that they know won't hurt them if they open their mouth and tell what, say what's on their mind. But they're worried that if they speak publicly, there's going to be repercussions. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And Jesus marveled, saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? This is interesting to me because they know that Jesus didn't go to the Hebrew school. They know that he didn't go to learn how to be a rabbi. And basically the attitude is this. He didn't learn from us what to say. So how can he possibly be a teacher? He didn't gain our magnificent wisdom. And there's a lot of that in this world today as well. I, I have dealt with some of it on my own. Um, you know, I do have a degree. I did go to school for ministry. But as I was going through school for ministry, <clears throat> there were, I remember multiple conversations I had to have with other students because we would have debates as part of our curriculum. And we would debate points. And I remember particularly one where uh, a, another student had said to me that I need to step back and try to look at things as they really are, as Scripture really says, because I've been indoctrinated by the church my whole life. And growing up in the church must have caused me to think all of these things. Now, I remember responding to him and saying, well, let me tell you my life story. I didn't go to church until I was 16. I never heard a Bible verse until I was 16. Everything that I know about Scripture comes from actually reading Scripture. I didn't have a church that taught doctrine. 
or shared with me these ideas. I'm getting these ideas from Scripture. So I actually think maybe you need to not be so caught up in whatever New Age book you're reading that tells you to think differently. Maybe you should look at Scripture freshly and think that maybe the answers are in God's Word and not in someone's explanation of it. But I got, I got drilled down because someone thought Someone thought that I was coming from a very naive perspective, that I was just kind of letting the world lead me along, that I was just part of this religious system that taught me things over and over, and I never really thought for myself because I was young and naive and I had some ideas that were similar to the professors at Liberty. That's a silly thing because I hadn't earned my degree yet. I didn't have the respect from the other students who were maybe a year or two ahead of me. Thought I hadn't learned enough yet to have, have, a fresh, have a good perspective on what Scripture says. That's silly. And Jesus is here standing. He didn't, of course, Jesus actually is God, and he knows what's going on, and he's speaking, and people are saying of him, he didn't get the wisdom of the other rabbis, so how could he possibly teach? Interestingly, in their own Scriptures, there are prophets who come up out of nowhere, and judges who spring up out of nowhere that God uses mightily without them also having gone to the school for the rabbis. And so even within their own scriptures, you have to understand that it's the work of the Spirit, not the world. That God is not looking at what paperwork you have to consider you ready to do work for him. He's looking at your heart. And that's what Jesus is telling you. Now, all these people are complaining. It's the middle of the feast. They're saying, this guy, what is he doing teaching? He's never studied with the rabbis. And Jesus answers and he says, my doctrine is not mine, but him who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself speaks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Did Moses not give you the law? Let none of you keeps the law. Why do you still seek to kill me? And so Jesus' response is that when someone is speaking to earn their own glory, when someone is teaching just to become famous or popular, they're not really doing God's work. But if they're only seeking glory, God's glory, then they're, they're authentic. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? And now the people answered and said, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And now they're looking and trying to make Jesus sound crazy. Like, who's looking to kill you? Meanwhile, everyone is. And Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you marvel. Now what he's talking about is what I mentioned before. He healed a man on the Sabbath day. A man that couldn't walk for 38 years, he healed him and he told him to pick up his mat and walk. So, Jesus worked on the Sabbath day, and then according to the, the traditions, the oral traditions, that man picking up his mat was considered work on the Sabbath day. A man who could never walk before suddenly could, and now they're yelling at him for working because he had to take steps and pick up his mat to do so. And they're upset with Jesus because he broke tradition, not the Mosaic law, but tradition. And so they're mad at him. But then he says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Now Jesus is saying, now you judge me for healing a man on the Sabbath day and saying that I worked, but according to the Mosaic law, when someone is born, when a, when a, a boy is born, on the eighth day, they have to get circumcised. If the eighth day happens to be the Sabbath day, you circumcise him, but that's work. So you're breaking the law according to your own standard. And what you don't see is how God orders things. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Saying, it's not a bad thing to help someone out on the Sabbath day. Now, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And what he's saying is, 
if you don't circumcise them, you're also breaking the law because you didn't circumcise them on the eighth day. So which law matters? Now some of them from Jerusalem says, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this truly is the Christ? However, we know that this man, where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. So now they're impressed. The people saw the showdown with the religious elite and they're like, this guy, he, he can talk back to them. My kind of guy, someone who has a backbone, who can speak up and not be concerned with the authorities. And that's what Jesus does. And it impresses everyone around him. And they say, is he the Christ? But some people in the crowd are saying, wait, there's this weird tradition and superstition that they have believed where they said, when, when the Messiah comes, we won't know where he's from. Now that's a, a tradition from a misinterpretation of a couple of scriptures. Because we do know where Messiah is from. It's in Micah 5.2. It says he comes from Bethlehem Ephrathah. That's where he's supposed to be born and from, from the city of David. We have to know he comes from the city of David because he's a descendant of David. So they had something wrong in their interpretation. And because of that, they refused to look at Jesus for who he is. So Jesus cried out and he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true. Whom do you do not know? But I know him and I am from him and he sent me. Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, he will do more signs than these, which this man has done. So now some people are coming to believe and they understand from the boldness that Jesus has. Now the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring and these things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer. And then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews among themselves said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? So now the people are confused. They don't understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus is telling them his future. He's saying, I'm going to sacrifice myself for you. And when I do that, you can't come with me. You're going to look for me. You're not going to find me. But they're thinking, <clears throat> they're looking for ways to disqualify him. Because they're confronted with truth. They're confronted with the Messiah, and they're confronted with God's truth, and they're looking for a way to look away from it. And so they come up with an excuse. And the excuse is, if he's saying he's going somewhere we can't follow, he must be going to the Gentiles. And if he's going to the Gentiles, then he's not the Messiah that I've read about, or that I think I've read about. And so that means he's disqualified as the Messiah. I'm not going to listen to what he says. They're trying to find excuses to not believe in Jesus. Now on the last day, now things are about to get interesting. All right, let me preface that. I know you probably listened to me ramble on, and you may have even nodded off a little bit, but now things are about to get exciting. Okay, because remember what I talked about in the beginning. Remember the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember the traditions. Remember the fire. And remember the water, because things are about to get really interesting. On the last day, the last great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So at the moment, the priest comes back with the water to start the libation ceremony. What I didn't tell you about it was there was also a pot filled with wine that also got poured out on the rocks. And wine was a represent, representation of the blood sacrifice. Water was a representation of life. And so at the same time, you have the wine and the water being poured out on the rocks, remi reminding them of what had happened in the wilderness wanderings with Moses when he struck the rock, and reminding them of the power of sacrifice and how that covered their sin. 
And at that moment, when the wine and the water is being poured out on the rocks, when they're supposed to remember how life-giving water was provided for them in the desert, Jesus picks that moment. And he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. That's a powerful moment. And all of Jerusalem is standing around and they're seeing the ceremony, remembering that God provided them water in the desert and reminding them of the sacrifices. And it's that moment that Jesus says, I am living water. Come to me and drink. And so the moment wasn't lost on this crowd. He picked his point of day to make sure he was making a strong point. And he said, come to me and drink. And he was speaking of the Spirit being poured out when he's glorified. Now tonight is communion. And communion was instituted at the Last Supper, six months later at Passover. And Jesus is sharing the Passover meal with his disciples. And he takes a cup of wine and he says, this is my blood which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body which is broken for you. Take this and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And he's pointing to the sacrifice. And he's pointing to what he's about to go through, and they're still lost. But then a moment becomes very clear. And Jesus is on the cross. All the disciples have run away, except for John, and he's there looking, and he sees Jesus in his last moments. And he gets to see Jesus scream out a word, tetelestai. That's the Greek word for it is finished. And it means that debt is canceled. The sin that we have built up in our lives is gone because of the sacrifice on the cross. And as he says this, he breathes out his last breath and he gives up his spirit. And the guards are wandering around and they realize the earth is shaking, the veil's torn in the temple. There's an earthquake and they're scared and they realize they need to get these people off the cross. And so they see the two thieves and they break their knees. They break their legs so that they'll die quicker, so they can get them off the cross and they can get back to safety. But Jesus, they look up and they say, he's already dead. And so to make sure, they poke Jesus with a stick in the side and out comes out of Jesus' side both blood and water. I imagine that the Pharisees who were there and the disciples who were there and the people who were there in Jerusalem at that moment who were there sitting at the foot of the cross, probably remembered this moment. As wine and water are being poured on the rocks, Jesus says, I am living water. Come to me and drink. And when he gets poked, blood and water come out of him. Because Jesus is life. And he's life when death happens. Death meets Jesus and life meets us. And through the power of the resurrection, he comes glorified and he gives us the Holy Spirit. This is a moment that's extremely powerful. And so we're going to celebrate it tonight via communion.